Hello, my name is Doreen Grasso, and I'm the Education and Program Manager here at the Brain Injury Association of Rhode Island. This informational video is for the parents, guardians, and caretakers of children who have sustained a concussion. We're glad that you could join us. We know all too well the challenges that can occur when a child gets a concussion, the confusion, the stress, anxiety, and sometimes even fear that can result from not knowing what's going on. A concussion is a brain injury. Oftentimes, this invisible injury is not very straightforward, but can be very complex. We want to let you know that we at Biari understand and we are here for you to help. We know you have many questions, and here are just some examples of the questions that we received from parents. How is a concussion diagnosed? Do they give a CT scan or an MRI? The emergency room won't give my son one, so how can I tell if he had a concussion or not? My daughter had a concussion and we saw our pediatrician. Now the athletic trainer at school says she needs to go through a return to play protocol before returning to soccer. What does that mean? How long before my child will be done with this concussion? ¿Cuánto tiempo antes de que mi hijo termine con esta concusión cerebral? Is there a test we can give him to know he is done with this concussion? ¿Hay alguna prueba que podemos hacerle para saber que ha terminado con esta concusión cerebral? How about the computerized test he took in the beginning of the season? ¿Qué tal esta prueba computarizada que tomó al comienzo de la temporada? Hi, thank you for taking my question. My daughter is a catcher on our fast pitch softball team, and she took a ball off of her face mask. How long should she wait before she can get back to practicing and playing? Uh, thanks for taking me. Um, I'm worried. My uh, child has been struggling academically since her concussion. Um, her teachers don't seem to know what to do. Um, will this get better? Will there be any long-term effects? Thank you for taking my question. Our grandchild had a concussion about six weeks ago. He followed doctor's orders, uh, reduced activity in school, work for a few weeks. And um, he's much better now and has been cleared to resume his normal activities. However, what happens if he gets another concussion in the future? Hi there. Uh, my question is, my child has a learning disability. Will this concussion make it worse? Those are some really great questions. And you may have the same questions yourself or even different ones. We want to let you know that the Brain Injury Association of Rhode Island is here to support you. You can find us online at BIARI.org, or you can call our office at 401-228-3319. We're here for you to answer your questions, assist you with navigating the resources that are available here in Rhode Island, or even interfacing with your child's school for return to play or return to learn strategies that are all outlined in the Rhode Island WEEP manual. We know it takes a team effort to meet your child's needs and yield the optimal outcomes. Here to talk more about this and to answer some of your questions raised is Dr. Karen McAvoy, author of the Rhode Island REAP and Get Schooled on Concussions. Introducing Dr. Karen McAvoy. Welcome, my name is Dr. Karen McAvoy and I am pleased to be here today to answer your questions about concussion and to introduce you to a resource in Rhode Island that has been customized for your community. The resource is called REAP, which stands for the four areas, remove, reduce, educate, adjust, accommodate, and pace, that we must all pay attention to and we must all work together through to get our young people safely through concussion recovery. Let's start with a really great question. How is a concussion diagnosed? Do they give them a CAT scan or an MRI? The emergency room didn't give one to my son, so how can we tell if he had a concussion or not? Well, a concussion is not a structural problem, meaning you will not see any type of damage or changes in the brain on a CAT scan or an MRI. A concussion is a functional problem. It's a cellular injury. And a functional problem will show in signs and symptoms in how your son acts and reacts, 
but because it's a cellular injury, it will not show on a CAT scan or an MRI. In fact, we try to minimize the amount of radiation exposure that comes from CAT scans to our young children because of the risk of cancer later in life. So if an emergency room does not feel that what they are looking at is a structural problem such as a bleed, and is in fact a concussion, which they will not see on a CAT scan or an MRI, they will choose to not actually put your child through a CAT scan or an MRI because of risk of radiation. That means that we diagnose a concussion based upon a clinical interview and a series of events. If there has been a hit to the head or a jolt to the body enough to shake the brain in the skull, and it is followed by either signs or symptoms in any of these four areas, physical, cognitive, emotional, and sleep and energy, that is enough for us to make the diagnosis of a concussion. Signs will be what you actually see, such as the person might be stumbling or repeating questions over and over. Symptoms will be what they report that they are feeling, such as I have a headache or I feel nauseous. A concussion is a software problem, not a hardware problem. You will not see it on the outside, but it is a cellular functional problem on the inside. We know that concussions happen frequently in sports. You can see on this chart that in male sports, football always has the highest rate of concussions. In female sports, soccer, basketball, softball, and volleyball have high rates as well. And when you factor in concussions during practice versus during competition, look how high the rate of concussion is in cheerleading. Our second question has to do with different types of sports. My daughter is a catcher. That's not a dangerous position to play. So when is it safe for her to go back? The playoffs are coming up soon and she really wants to participate. Well, I have attached here the classification of sports according to the American Academy of Pediatrics. They break down sports by types of sports, contact sports, limited contact, and non-contact sports. They do not break down sports by position. So you can see that there are some sports that are more risky to play, the contact sports, and some that are less risky, such as non-contact. But with concussion management, if you have a concussion, you, in theory, need to be out of all sports, any sport that can possibly risk another hit to the head, even if it is a non-contact sport because in sports, there are balls flying, there are bodies that crash into each other, etc. That is why schools will often remove a student from PE, from play at recess, and from any recreational or school-sponsored sport if there is a concussion, regardless of what type of sport or what position they play. That is because it is still risky for someone to be involved in any type of sport where they could hit their head again while they are currently being treated or recovering from a concussion. In the early 2000s, because there were some young athletes who were sustaining a concussion in play and then going back to play too soon while they were still symptomatic and sustaining a second hit to the head and then having permanent brain damage or death, all 50 states and the District of Columbia moved forward with return to play legislation that prevents students from going back to play too soon and sustaining that second hit to the head if they are currently recovering from a concussion. But we don't want to forget about our students who are not athletes and are also getting concussions. Did you know that about 40% of the students that we support in schools have received their concussions in non-sports related ways? That means that maybe they had a motor vehicle accident or they slipped in the shower or on ice or they were a victim of assault. Those students need to be supported in schools for their concussion just as much as the athletes do. Many parents will ask us, well, my child wasn't knocked out. Did he really have a concussion? Yes. Here are the list of common symptoms. Headache is the most common symptom with concussion, and loss of consciousness is a very small percentage of students who have a concussion. But you do not need to have loss of consciousness in order to be diagnosed with a concussion. 
So how long will it take for my child to be done with this concussion? Well, it's very favorable that the research shows that about 70% of students with a concussion between the ages of 5 and 18 will resolve from their concussion in about four weeks. That means that some students will resolve within a week or so, and some will take a little bit longer, like three to four weeks. But that is a very favorable outcome. Some parents want to know if there is a test that we can give to your child that will let us know when they are done with their concussion. There are some computerized neurocognitive tests out there. Sway is one of them. CNS Vital Signs is another. Perhaps the most commonly used one is called the Impact Test, which has a pediatric version that is given to six to 11 year olds on an iPad and for children above the age of 12 to 80, that test is given on a computer. This is a picture of the readout from the impact test and you can see that the range of average on this test goes from 16 to 84 percent, but 50 percent is right smack average. For this student, you can see that verbal, visual, memory, processing speed and reaction time were fairly low the first time that we tested them in the one percentile only up to the 33 percentile, but scores improve over time up to the 40, 50, 60 percentile eventually. And you can see that the total symptom score goes down over time from a 92 to a 20. However, a word of caution about neurocognitive testing. It cannot be used in isolation for diagnosis, and it cannot be used in isolation for clearance processes. There needs to be corroborating information from parents, from teachers regarding symptoms before a student can be safely put back to play. And while many of you have heard that a baseline is necessary with neurocognitive testing, it is not necessary for in all cases. In most cases with athletes, we do try to give them a baseline so that we can see where they are at before they get a concussion, and then we can compare them to when they get a concussion later. However, if we do not have a baseline, we can still use this test as a helpful way for progress monitoring and as one piece of data for clearance. Some people need rehabilitation in order to get through recovery of concussion. The biggest culprits for longer recovery of a concussion is going to be with eyes and ears. Eye tracking can get off sometimes after a concussion and occupational or physical therapy can help with ocular motor exercises. The inner ear where the vestibular system lives will impact balance and so vestibular physical therapy can help with that. Other types of physical therapy can help with muscle strain and whiplash in the neck and the head, which causes headaches. And some of our students just simply need a little extra support with sleep hygiene and being able to manage the demands of life that impact their mood and behavior while they are coming through the recovery of a concussion. I'm gonna go through the REAP of this manual and you will see how much of the guidance we have just reviewed is incorporated into this little booklet. REAP is an interdisciplinary community-based concussion management approach that requires that four teams work together. The four teams are color-coded. Everything in orange is for the family to read. Everything in green is for the healthcare professionals to read and follow. And everything in blue is for the school professionals to read and follow. The school breaks down to a light blue team, which is gonna be the school physical team, such as the coach or the athletic trainer and some sometimes the school nurse, versus the dark blue team, which is the school academic team, and that will be the counselor, the teachers, and again, sometimes the school nurse. We start with remove and reduce. Since you now know that having a concussion and sustaining a second hit to the head while you are still symptomatic from a concussion can be catastrophic for our young children in that they can sustain permanent brain damage or death, 
the first and most important part we have to do with the concussion management is to remove all students from any further potential hits to the head while they are recovering from a concussion. So family and schools and medical teams will remove them from all physical play where they can hit their head again and reduce some of the stimulation at home and at school. Not eliminate all of that stimulation, but just simply reduce it except for physical activity that is eliminated until it is safe to put them back to any kind of physical activity. Secondly, we allow the symptoms to educate us on how well the student is coming through recovery from the concussion. Remember that the symptoms fall into physical, cognitive, emotional, and sleep and energy symptoms. We expect those symptoms to be most intense and frequent in the beginning of a concussion, but they should start to get better slowly every day, every week over time. That allows us to know that the brain is healing and that the symptoms are subsiding, therefore the concussion is getting better. We explain concussion to our students in this way. When you have a concussion, you are like an iPhone 6 instead of an iPhone 13. You're not broken, but you just need to bring your charger around because you're going to run out of energy sooner. Or you are a car with a small gas tank. If you were a car with a small gas tank, you could get out of the garage, but you're not going to cover as much territory. And so we work with our students to be able to manage their energy so that they can manage their symptoms until they can get resolution from their concussion. The third thing we focus on in REAP is to adjust and accommodate the day-to-day -day activities for the student. We ask parents and teachers to slightly adjust and accommodate the amount of stimulation that the student engages in every day at school and at home. We ask that they not be out of school during that time. We want them listening and learning, but we just ask the teachers to be aware of the concussion and to cut back slightly on the demands at school and for parents to cut back slightly on some of the social activities at home. This is some of the guidance in the REAP book for your educators to know how to cut back on some of the demands at school so that they can support your child as they come through the recovery of a concussion. Specific guidance for your teachers has been customized for Rhode Island under the Get Schooled on Concussion Materials. If you are a teacher and want to know how to access these, contact the Brain Injury Association of Rhode Island for the link and password. While we're on the topic of return to learn, let's answer this question. I'm worried. My child has been struggling academically after her concussion. Her teachers don't seem to know what to do. Will this get better or will there be long-term effects from her concussion? Well, it is quite possible that there are some short-term effects from a concussion in the cognitive area. We expect that. And that's why we do everything we can to help all teachers know how to support their students symptomatically and with their learning as they return to school from a concussion. We don't expect kids to be out of school for too long. We want them to be back in school within a couple of days to a week and their teachers doing everything they can to bring down the load to keep learning going through the entire process of recovery. And we know that if we hold them out for from school for too long, we tend to get other types of symptoms such as they get uh, anxious and they begin to feel sad that they're not with their friends. So we do expect that there will be some academic dysfunction for up to a month. Um, we don't expect it to have long-term grade or credit consequences. However, if you are a parent who is struggling with this, know that all schools already have in place a system by which they can support students with any type of medical, social, psychological issue that is a barrier to academics for months or weeks uh, or years longer if need be. Simply contact your school principal, school nurse, counselor, if you need that level of support. If you are the parent of a child who already has a learning disability, will the concussion make this worse? Well, knowing now that a concussion is an energy drain to the system, anything that was a bit of a weakness prior to the concussion can get amplified during recovery from the concussion. So if you have a child who has a history of headaches or has a history of learning issues, attentional issues, depression or anxiety, it is very common for those issues to be amplified or to 
be heightened during recovery from a concussion. Because again, remember, a concussion is an energy drain on the system. And all students want to know, when can I get back to my sport or PE or play at recess? This is the checklist in the REAP manual that walks you through all the various criteria that is necessary to achieve before clearance can be made. As a parent, you want to make sure that your student is back to baseline levels of symptoms and activities at home. We want to make sure that the student is back to their pre-concussion learning levels as confirmed by teachers. We want to make sure that they are back to their baseline level of neurocognitive testing if a baseline was available, if not, at least within the range that we think they should be functioning. We want to make sure that they are discharged from all therapies if they went through rehabilitation or have approval from their athletic trainer that their symptoms are back to baseline. We want to make sure that they are off all medications for symptoms of concussion. And of course, we want to have input from a healthcare provider or a medical doctor that the student is back to their level of a symptom, non-concussive level of activity. The REAP manual has a symptom checklist that you can use to keep track of symptoms periodically. The REAP manual also has a teacher feedback form to make sure that teachers have a chance to weigh in on whether the student is back to their pre-concussion learning level. And when there is consensus amongst the four teams, the family team, the school academic team, the school physical team, and the medical team, that the student is back to their baseline level of functioning, then it is time to start the graduated return to play steps. That fits with this question. My daughter had a concussion and we saw our pediatrician. Now the athletic trainer at school says she needs to go through a return to play protocol before returning to soccer. What does that mean? What that is saying is that your daughter has fit the criteria where it is safe to start to introduce that last piece, that physical return to play piece. The graduated return to play steps are guidelines that are recommendations for all of our professional athletes and elite athletes internationally to slowly safely return to play. So if it's good for our elite athletes, it's good for all of our students returning to play. The concept behind it is that once we are sure that the student is safe to start adding back in physical activity, we will add in that activity one step per day, making sure that they do not flare symptoms as we increase that physical exertion. If they can get through each step without provocation of symptoms, then we can eventually take them all the way through this, these steps and clear them safely back to their sport. It is just the safest way to do it. So it may take a few extra days for the athletic trainer to put your daughter through those steps, but it is the safest way to make sure that we have full resolution of the concussion before we potentially put her back to play where she could sustain another hit to the head. That takes us to this final question. Our grandchild had a concussion about six weeks ago. He followed doctor's orders for reduced activity and schoolwork for a few weeks. Now he is much better and has been cleared to resume normal activity. What happens if he gets another concussion in the future? Well, we're happy to hear that your grandchild had a good typical recovery from a concussion. And in theory, once they've been cleared to go back to play or sports, we don't worry about them having more concussions or that we need to watch them closer or restrict their physical um, activities. However, having said that, there are some students where there seems to be a vulnerability to get another concussion with less impact, so it's easier to get the next concussion, and that it may get harder and longer for each recovery with each concussion. We do know from research that there are some genetic factors, there are some gender differences, which might have to do with hormonal and muscle strength, and we can't predict which student is going to have these um, vulnerabilities um, compared to another student. After someone recovers from a concussion and goes back to play, we hope that we do not see them again. But if there is a vulnerability, 
what we will typically see is that it will be easier for them to get the next concussion and it might get harder for them to resolve from each concussion. So with each student, we have to basically wait and let time and recovery tell us if they have a bit of a vulnerability for future concussions. But there are many students who have one concussion, get through it fine, and don't really have any more concussions. And there are some students who then begin to have that vulnerability of cells where they are at higher risk or are more easily impacted by another hit to the head. If you have additional questions that we did not answer in this presentation, here are some Rhode Island resources as well as national resources. On the back of your Rhode Island REAP manual, here is your return to play legislation. And here are all the partners in Rhode Island that brought REAP to your state. It was a pleasure answering your questions today. If you want more information, contact the Brain Injury Association of Rhode Island at BIARI.org or contact them at 401-228-3319. Thank you.